for joining us for Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host, Tanisha Spain, and joining me in the studio today are two of our panelists who are ready to talk about creepy crawlies and what's going on in your garden. So before we get into that, let's have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty. So ladies first, we'll start with you. Hello out there in TV land. I'm Marty Alanya, and I'm a private landscaper. I, I keep trying to get away, but somehow, I'm still doing it. I, I don't know how that works, but I kind of specialize in perennials, small shrubs, the, the home landscape. Um, I, I know big romping plants, and you do too, because you've planted them where they don't go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, call Marty before you put the tree yes, in. Yes, yes. Okay, Phil? I'm Phil Nixon. I'm a extension educator, or extension specialist, or had was uh, retired, is what I am. And I do, um, being an entomologist, I answer questions about insects, bugs. So if it creeps or crawls or both, I'm good. Yes, and you also bring in your bonsai a lot of time. Yes. Uh, the bonsai guy. Yeah, I'm, so. a, I'm a bonsai hobbyist. Yes, yes. We've got some great panelists with all kinds of things that they do. So um, let's jump in and get started. They both brought, both brought things to show you. So um, Phil, we'll start with you. Well, if for those of you who are living under a rock, <laughs> you do not realize that the Japanese beetles are out. They've arrived. They have arrived. We are here. And uh, and so for those who have not had the pleasure. Is a June bug the same as a Japanese beetle? No. Yes no? and no. I've heard that used interchangeably, but I always wondered if it's it was It should correct. not be used interchangeably. Okay. A, uh, they are both scarab beetles. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're... If your studies, uh, if you're, uh, if you're, if you study the uh, uh, the Egyptian stuff, you know that there's this big dung beetle that rolls the world around. That's a scarab. So uh, you probably didn't need to know that. <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, uh, there's actually the uh, the cover Anecdotal. of a very major <laughs> entomological journal shows a dung beetle rolling the world with its back legs. So, Interesting. You know, so that's part of it. <laughs> but uh, but this is a Japanese beetle. It is another type of scarab. Uh, it's a very large family of insects. And so, uh, and June beetles are scarabs as well. So, um, so calling one a June beetle is not really correct, but you're not totally far off from right. being totally wrong. I'll <laughs> correct people How's from here for, on for out. <laughs> strange and different. But at any rate, uh, as you can see, this is a Fabulously beautiful insect. It's uh, it's uh, metallic green in color, with coppery wing covers, and uh, and is um, is just a just a real pretty insect. It didn't do nasty things all mm -hmm. to us. Uh, Sounds like you're describing a sports us. car. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> they are beautiful. They can do nasty They're things to you too. <laughs> so, <laughs> so at any rate, uh, uh, they do come out. Uh, the larvae live on um, on grass roots. And mm -hmm. uh, and can be a problem in your lawn, particularly mm -hmm. they like those that are watered well. So if you're not watering your lawn this spring, you probably uh, you're probably not going to have a problem too much with Japanese beetles. Oh, well, your lawn may die from not having enough water. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the yeah. larvae like the like the more <laughs> moist turf. Uh, the adults come out in the latter part of June, and they will feed for about six weeks on um, on. Uh, Pretty much, I think the, the host list is somewhere around 250 species of plants long. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, some of the things they like the most uh, are roses, including the petals of roses. Mm -hmm. uh, they like uh, they like pretty much anything else in the rose family, which means all of our fruit trees, mm -hmm. apples, peaches, pears, plums. Um, they uh, they like smart weed probably more than anything else. So for those people who say, how come bugs don't ever feed on weeds? This one loves smart weed, uh, and some other types of, of weeds as well. Uh, so uh, and uh, what they will do is unlike most insects who would <coughs> who would like to uh, like to hide uh, out of the sun and out of the light, mm -hmm. essentially out of the notice of birds, which are major predators of insects. Yeah, birds. Uh, the uh, uh, Yikes! They will uh, they will feed on the upper side of the leaves, and uh, and initially the damage will will tend to be they will do what we call window feeding. They will they will eat through in this case the upper epidermis or surface of a leaf, eat the center part out, which is 
for those who are techy enough to know. It's called mesophyll. It has all the chlorophyll and everything in it. And it leaves the lower surface. And so you get these brownish areas because the lower surface, the lower epidermis has died off. As the beetles get a little bit older, they will eat all the way through the leaf and uh, make some of the nicest filigree you could ever hope for. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, but unfortunately it's on your plants. And they will do a number on this. This is grape, which is one of their favorite plants. Uh, right now in my yard, that seems to be the only thing they're eating right now yet. Uh, which is fine because it's all wild grape, I don't care anyway. But at any rate, the, uh, they will feed on, on those. And they'll feed, like I said, for about six weeks, till about the middle of August, and then they'll kind of tail off. Um, this damage, because it occurs in the second half of the season, is not a major harm to the health of most plants. The trees that have these or, or bushes may not grow quite as well, or as, but they're not going to die from it. Uh, feeders on, in the spring can cause the death of trees and shrubs by mm -hmm. weakening and, and using up the, uh, eating the leaves that were, that were made from the, from the uh, sugars and, and, and stored food for over the winter. But these leaves already have produced probably as much stored food as that plant's gonna need. Mm -hmm. uh, it would produce more if it didn't, wasn't gone, but it still would, uh, still in pretty good shape. And, the leaves, and if they're very heavily damaged, trees or shrubs will put on, or, or plants will put on more leaves. That will probably kind of be a, a net, mm -hmm. neither loss nor gain, mm -hmm. uh, because they'll probably produce enough food to have made up enough storage to reimburse the plant for what it took to build the leaves the first time, more or less. <laughs> okay. That makes any Circle sense. Of life. Okay. Uh, but that tree has to go, or shrub has to go into the winter with enough food storage in their plant, in the plant, to make the leaves next spring to start getting more food. I mean, that's just, mm -hmm. if you think about it, mm -hmm. it makes sense. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so your spring feeders are a problem. Summer feeders like Japanese beetles are not so much. Now, what can you do about this? Well, anything which is an insecticide toxicant, uh, Stomach poison will kill the Japanese beetles quite well. Kill them. So there's carbaryl soda seven, which is a problem because of its particle size of um, of bees collecting it. So you don't ever want to get that on the on the flower blossoms. Okay. But the leaves are fine. Bees have no business looking for food on on leaves <laughs> most of the time. Thankfully, this is in the tropics where you have nectaries on leaves, uh, so uh, so they don't they stay off them, it's fine. Uh, Rotenone will work for those people who want to use something which is which is organic. There are systemics and and uh, the two most common are amatocloprid, which has been linked with some concerns associated with pollinators. Okay. But again, if a, if a plant does not bloom, which you know your trees and shrubs generally are blooming in the spring of the year, most of them, and they have several months before they're gonna do it again. The amatocloprid can last more than a year, but the levels by the time you go through two or three months mm -hmm. really drop down tremendously to where probably there's no if any effect. Uh, okay. And it takes very little of amatocloprid to somehow disrupt the memory of insects to where Bees don't find their way home to their hive and things of this nature. So, uh, so even even those levels are normally below those, uh, as best we do, our research shows. Uh, and so, so uh, I've heard of some people the clofi anodin, which is is less of a problem, and uh, and is not not really concerned uh, that direction. So there are options you can do, but uh, the seven or rotenone or a pyrethroid will last about a week to mm -hmm. ten days. The beetles are, you can usually squeeze that to two weeks. Okay. Uh, and they're out six weeks, which mm -hmm. means you have to spray one, two, three times. Mm -hmm. Okay. A systemic, it's only once and it won't last that long. So okay. those are the pros and cons uh, of doing something. And the important thing to realize is don't get into this business of it's eating my plant. I don't want it. I'm going to kill it wherever it is. Because, you know, the crab apple tree whose main function is to kind of hide, you fr hide, hide the garbage can from being looked at, <laughs> is not important to be sprayed and killed the beetles. 
treat those plants that are maybe the crab apple next to your front door where everybody comes, including you, sees that every day. Mm -hmm. That may be more worthwhile. Pick and choose. Okay. Uh, controlling the beetles in the yard is not going to control the beetles next year. Or it's next going to have door. essentially <laughs> zero effect unless everybody for 15 miles around you did that. Mm -hmm. That's how fast they'll, that's how far they fly in a single season is approximately 15 miles. So, you know, if you own a big palatial estate 30 miles across, you can protect the center part <laughs> next to your estate house. Other than that, you can't. Now I have to ask a question because we'll have people write in and say, loved Phil's discussion, but what is the natural option? What is the non-chemical option? Known, I just said it. Okay. And your natural pyrethrins. And then? If they're synergized, if you just spray regular pyrethrin on it, they'll fall down, take a, take a deep sleep for a few hours, come back to life. Come back. Gotcha. Okay. Particularly big beetles like this. So, okay. so, um, so your pyrethroids, uh, uh, the natural pyrethrum is a knockout chemical. Got it. It's not a killer unless mm -hmm. you put a little another chemical in with it. A synergist, which now you're back to non-organic, but by itself it doesn't kill the insect. Mm -hmm. But the two together do. Got it. Okay. You got it. It'll knock them out and do it. Does, and, is milky spore effective against the grub? <sighs> It's hard to say. Milky spore is, is a disease, a bacterial disease, which will attack the grubs and make their blood turn milky color. That's hence the name, milky spore. Uh, and, uh, and so the dead grubs turn milky looking. Uh, but uh, uh, it is very effective. However, the, uh, the stuff that you buy commercially in recent years has not been very effective. And we don't know if it's somehow they're handling them, mm. or this. Most of these diseases will also grow uh, saprophytically mm -hmm. uh, on on some sort of a culture medium, mm -hmm. and that's a whole lot cheaper than growing it inside live insects because you have to pay them grow the insects. You know? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but they lose many times. Diseases will lose their potency in growing on After something dead. Mm -hmm. So um, okay. So we don't oh. know, but uh, I did some research, and it's been probably 10 or 15, 12 years, uh, but, uh, but I only got like uh, 20 to 40% control, whereas your typical milky spore disease on Japanese beetle grubs, should you give you 97 to 90, 95 to 97% kill. Those are good numbers. Those, like are those. Yeah. Like those numbers. Those are big, heavy numbers. Okay. So I remember a neighbor those are had one of those COVID <laughs> numbers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> one of our neighbors had one of those contraptions that caught them. I mean, every Japanese beetle in town went to this guy's house. He was or emptying at least that a bag. Blocks away. He was emptying <laughs> that bag constantly and I thought, man, you must be drawing them over oh, to your Yeah. But it works for everybody else in the neighborhood, so. Yeah. It works. It's <laughs> a, as, as it's I, as I, like to I tell, think. It does, it in fact attracts As I've liked to tell people for over the decades uh, on this is, is that the best way to use a Japanese beetle trap is to give it to your neighbor. Yeah. <laughs> because it's been, proven, <laughs> it's been proven beyond <laughs> doubt yes. that the traps will draw them to mm -hmm. your yard, but once they get into their yard, they look around and say, what's more fresh and tasty here? Ah. And you will have considerably more damage yes. to the plants in did. your yard if you have a Japanese beetle trap in your yard. Um, so gift it to your I love the neighbor that I had. He had apple trees. And they were the worst apple trees for damage. There wasn't hardly a leaf on the trees. And he had three beetle traps under the trees over garbage cans because they were putting so much out. Wow. Yes. Yes. And and I said, you realize that those traps are making it worse on there. He says, oh, no, it'd be a whole lot worse on those trees if I didn't have those traps. I said, you don't have a leaf on the tree. <laughs> you have a giant flashing neon sign. Yeah. You know, Eat it's here. just kind of, but if you're, <laughs> but there's been, there's been research done in Kentucky, in Ohio, in Iowa, uh, Massachusetts, all over the place, showing most commonly on roses, that if you yeah. have Japanese beetle trap in, in the vicinity of roses, you will have a lot more damage on your roses. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank so, you, sir. You know, I always tell, make sure the trap's at least 50 feet away from what you're trying to protect. And 
100, 200, 300 feet is even better. Okay. Because mm -hmm. they will come from about a block, block, one to two blocks away. Wow. Which is, you know, a typical block I think 400 feet. So okay. you're looking at uh, you know, 1,000 feet away, close yes. to that. Yes. All location, right. location. Yes, location. absolutely. All right, Marty, uh, what did you bring us? I brought some pitiful examples. I almost said that, but I thought, <laughs> I'm not going to insult her. <laughs> this is my address. Um, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a native plant, if I'm not mistaken. The natives grow three feet tall. This is a, a hybridized variety called Kobold, K-O-B-O-L-D, and it only gets about half that tall. I caught these at um, a place that doesn't, it's not a garden center, but it sells plants. So I won't reveal the name. I don't want to get sued. So they should have, they should have done some different things in the care of these plants. And that's why they were way on sale. <laughs> so I bought them. Okay, so these plants are perennials. And I love perennials because one and done, baby. Yeah, that'd be <laughs> it. We're all done now. You know, I'll give them a squirt of water now and then. Good luck with that. So these these spikes get tall. They get tall purple spikes on them. Ooh. It's like a bottle brush flower. Oh, wow. Kind of a medium lavender. Butterflies and pollinators love these plants. And they have a different look in the garden. They're, they're tall and spiky instead of low... You know, they have, they just have a different look. They have these, it's hard to tell, but here. Um, they have little leaves all the way up and down the, the, the flower stalk. So they kind of have a lily type of a look. Mm -hmm. And they don't, they, they, they have a small footprint. You know, the, most of their size is in their height. And like I said, they get this one 18 inches tall, maybe 20. Mm -hmm. So in the garden, from the ground, it would be, you know, like this. And these spikes, <clears throat> they just keep sending them up for, the, for most of the season. But these were uh, kind of miserable. This one was broken. It's very And sad. like so many on our show. Oh, yeah. The more miserable looking the plant, the more you bring home. I can't help That's it. That's a theme across our show. <laughs> it was cheap. <laughs> so, I, you know, I gave a couple of bucks for mm -hmm. these. They are dead hardy. They're hardy to Canada. And oh. I got about six or seven of them. And these were the, these are the two best looking ones. <laughs> <laughs> what is the name of it again? It pretty bad. Um, I always said Liatris, but people say Liatris to you. Isn't that sometimes called Dame's Rocket or something like no, that? No, it's... Uh, oh, oh uh, gosh. Liatris. Yeah, Liatris. Liatris I could um, look it up, but... I kind of like watching you guys struggle. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but you pay for on public television. <laughs> L-I-A-T-R-I-S. Yeah. Oh, she's got a pooter. Oh, shoot. Look at there. Now I can't do my password. So anyway, but anyway. <clears throat> um, these, like I said, they're dead hardy. I'm going to plant these. I got six or seven of them. And I'm going to plant them. They love sun. They tolerate drought. I mean, they're just about as... As carefree as they could possibly be. Blazing Since stars? Blazing stars. Blazing stars. Star, that's it. Yeah. Google for the like, win. Feather, well, I don't so know. So you would put this, oh, that is pretty. So these yeah. would go with like in the back row if you're doing a garden because yeah. they're going to get kind of. There are, like I said, there are taller varieties, mm -hmm. two to three feet tall, but this, this hybrid here, they come in lavender and then there's also some white varieties. Mm. But as pitiful as these look, I'm going to plant them. Okay, let's These, talk about that. Yeah, I'm going to plant them. When you them. get pitiful looking plants from the garden center, because yeah. now everything's going on sale. Heck yeah. How are you going to give these a good start once you put them in? I almost brought a big bowl so I could, <laughs> so I could uncork one and show you, but I didn't know. So um, when I plant, I plant, make the hole as deep as the pot and twice as wide. Three times as wide is even better because the roots in this root ball have to join with the the loose soil in the hole before it freezes otherwise when it freezes that ball in the hole will shrink down air will get down in there and the the roots will freeze so you plant these same depth that they are fill in adequately around i mean like i said twice as wide as the pot it's a couple more shovelfuls it's not that big a deal make the hole straight up and down. You can even make it cone shaped and wider at the bottom than it is at the top slightly. But don't make a planting hole shaped like a funnel. 
because this needs and when it heaves and it will a little bit in the winter it's going to just squirt it up like you ever have a snow cone mm -hmm. and you squeeze it too hard and it goes yeah yep. it's not it's not, oh that's not I what you want I hate that no it's not what you want okay so a straight up and down hole is going to help the plant stay in the hole over winter if it if it and especially if you get a lot of freezing and thawing because it's you know it's cold, it's not cold, it's cold, it's mm -hmm. not cold. And that's the part that causes heave. If everything would just freeze and stay like that, that's not a big deal. But that's not what happens here in central Illinois. So, okay. so when you put this in, pull this out, put your hand here, and then just push on the bottom of the pot. And look what happens. E -e, e -e, it's loose. E -e. Yeah. When you pull that out, there'll be a flat edge, a sharp edge at the top, and a sharp edge at the bottom. Eliminate that. Just hold the plant with one hand and do like this. Just tease Just it out. Just tease all of the out. Yeah, turn that turn that pot shaped root ball and do just the uh, well, you know, round it off as much as you possibly can. Do it right over the hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then set it down in there. Back fill it. Water it real nicely. Give it a couple inches of mulch. And when you're establishing perennials, you're going to have to water them. You know, I usually water the first few days in a row. Okay. And then after that, maybe twice a week, you know, okay. you just kind of wean off. And when you start seeing new growth, yay, awesome. they're happy. So okay. these are going to these are going to survive just fine, just fine. Blazing and the, and the other five as well. But any perennial that you do that with, um, if it's got green on it and looks reasonably unmiserable you can save it <laughs> come on okay. shake shake loose of a couple bucks take a chance columbus did hey. <laughs> all right we're back to phil you've got some photos this time mm -hmm. around so what are we talking about uh solid webworm and okay we've had a dry summer mm -hmm. spring and uh this is the adult stage of the sod webworm it's a moth, a slender moth, who will come to lights at night or kick up as you walk across the yard. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they're about three quarters of an inch long. They have, they're called snout moths because they have palps that stick out in front like a snout. And they're also called closed wing moths because their wings are held tightly against their body in a tube shape. Uh, they're going to be kind of a tan color to a very light color. They'll look almost whitish when they're just a little off-white as they're flying around. And, uh, and if you see them flying around, they'll typically kick up out of the grass during the daytime and they'll fly uh, 15, 20 feet and then settle back down. And in the process, they'll kind of fly in a dipping up and down motion mm -hmm. and probably not get any higher in your head. About five feet's about it. Okay. Uh, and uh, you kind of can sneak up on them and see what they look like. If you are walking across your, your yard, uh, you know, 50, 60 feet, and you kick up two or three of these, uh, that's probably, and, it's, and the soil is dry, uh, you're probably set up to have a problem. Uh-oh. And that's why I'm talking about them during a, a drought sort of situation. This insect will produce larvae that will feed in the, uh, at the soil surface uh, at night. They will clip off uh, grass blades yeah. and haul them back in and, and, and eat on their, uh, eat the grass blades. And you end up getting patchy areas of, uh, of turf. We can move to the next slide. Uh, you'll see that you'll get these indistinct areas of brownish turf mm -hmm. used most commonly in the driest area possible. This is on a slope, which is going to drain faster. Mm -hmm. And blackbirds, starlings, cowbirds, these sorts of things, robins love to eat these things. And so you may have flocks of them during the summer on them. Uh, these larvae also overwinter, which is why you see them in the early spring. It's the only bug in town to a great certain extent. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you see lots of blackbirds and you've got some indistinct areas of brown, if you do nothing, you will have in, you will have a complete area of brown. And if you water quickly, you can save the grass, but if you don't, it will die off. And it's easily controlled with, with seven insecticides or pyrethroids, anything which is sprayed on the leaf and, and will, will kill them. There's several generations of this a year, typically three in the central Midwest, and uh, and so you'll end up getting, uh, you can get them essentially anytime during the spring fruit fall. 
Okay, we've got about a minute and a half left. Uh, how are your yards and gardens looking? I just witnessed um, those being eaten oh, with you did. joy this morning by yeah. the blackbirds and <laughs> nice. the starlings. Yeah, yeah I was Very walking nice. the dog and I'm like, wonder what those guys are eating. And now, now I know. Now you know. <laughs> now you know. You guys been doing a lot of watering? No. I haven't really got around to that yet. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I, we mow high <laughs> and we have, uh, I live in the country, which means that nobody stole my nice black soil, which goes down two uh -huh. feet and <laughs> 30 inches. And so it's doing pretty well. I mow it over three inches. Yeah. Uh, my wife does. She does the mowing. I'm allergic to mowed grass. Uh, likely story. Likely so. story. <laughs> uh, but, I was going to say. Uh, but at any rate, that's, uh, yeah. that's a, uh, uh, it's, it's doing well. And the reason that the, uh, that, that the sod webworm are a problem when it's, when it's dry is because there's a fungus disease that occurs naturally, takes them out when we have normal rainfall in Illinois. Gotcha. And would also do that in, a, in an irrigated turf. But most people, lawn irrigation is not near as common as sure. it used to be. In my opinion, that's a good thing. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, okay. but you do have to watch out for times like this. We've got to leave it there. Thank you guys so much for coming in. Appreciate your time. And thank you so much for watching. If you've got a question for our panelists, you can send it in to yourgarden at gmail.com or look for us on socials. Just search Mid American Gardener. And we'll see you next time. Good night.